Hey guys, Charles here. Uh, let's do AP Micro 2021 number one. This is set two. Set two. I think these were the ones that people had to do uh, online. Notice that there's a monopoly question here and then it flows into an oligopoly question. So we have really two, two different parts as one, I think making it a little bit more complicated, but not too bad. The monopoly question is fairly simple. Uh, heart is a corporation that has developed and patented a new drug to treat heart disease. There are no substitutes, so they have a monopoly. Draw a correctly labeled graph of heart making positive economic profits and show. So all we really have to do here is draw a monopoly graph with a downward sloping demand, marginal revenue going below a quantity line there making it a little bit negative. Here's a price, draw a nice Nike swoosh, marginal cost curve, know where profit max is, right? Even though they're making profits, we need our profit maximizing quantity and profit maximizing price, or MR equals, sorry, yeah, equals MC, sorry, I had brain fart there just for a second, where marginal revenue equals marginal cost, Marginal cost and marginal revenue come together. We go straight down. That's our quantity. Now remember to find the price you have to go straight. Everything bounces off the price curve. Not only is this the demand curve, it's the average revenue and the price. You have to know that. It makes it helpful. If this is marginal revenue here, that's your mister. That's your DARP. Mr. DARP we're going to go straight up till we hit that DARP curve or the price curve and we're going to draw across and that's PM. So PM and QM right there. Uh, they're easy enough. We need to show positive economic profits. All we need to know, oops, let's move that down just a bit. All we need to know is to show positive economic profits is to draw in an ATC that looks like that, that is below that price. And this ATC is definitely below the price. All right. And they're not even asking us to draw in the profits or show it or anything. Uh, they then would go to B at QM, at this quantity, from part A, is demand elastic, unit elastic, or inelastic explain. Uh, recognize that where marginal revenue is zero, right there where marginal revenue equals zero. If we draw a line straight up, Tick, 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 where we hit the demand curve, that is unit elastic. If that's unit elastic, that means this bottom section of the demand curve, all of this down here is inelastic. All of the demand curve section up here is elastic. What we know is that Look at the marginal revenue curve here. Notice how it's positive. Where marginal revenue is positive, that is the elastic section of our demand curve. The price that we're charging in that quantity, notice how they come right there in the elastic section of the demand curve because and we explain it using marginal revenue is positive. Easy enough. Uh, all right, C. Instead of maximizing profits, suppose Hart considers providing a new drug to as many patients as possible as long as it can generate enough revenue to cover its total cost. Well, if you're covering your total cost, you are what we call breaking even. If you're breaking even, you're making zero economic profit. All of this we need to know, not necessarily for this. We have to know at least that, this question. Also called a normal profit. Break even is where your price equals your ATC. So right where price, the demand curve, hits your ATC or your ATC hits that demand curve, that right there is the quantity QZ, QZ, uh, to show the quantity that is consistent with breaking even or just covering your total cost as zero economic or normal profit. So wherever the ATC and the demand curve intersect, we go straight down, and that's our quantity to cover our total cost, to just cover our total cost. 
At QZ from part C1, is there a dead weight loss? I explain. What we sort of should know, and I'm going to draw it right here and then I'll get rid of it, but if we, because this is a little sloppy up here. Here's our demand, here's our marginal revenue again, marginal cost. Um, where we know our price, remember this is not only demand, it's DARP, where price equals marginal cost, there it is what we call allocative efficiency. Allocative efficiency, there is no dead weight loss. If we were here producing at profit max, and this is what we're most used to, that triangle right there is our dead weight loss. Anytime we're producing on this side, you can see if I produce that quantity right there, you can see that all of that becomes dead weight loss because I am not producing at allocative efficiency. Anytime I'm producing either more or less than the allocative efficient amount, there has to be dead weight loss. So when we look up here, we can see that at QZ, we're, put, we're producing to the right of allocative efficiency. So in essence, I could draw that in right there and I could show all of that as dead weight loss as I needed. And we would explain that in saying that um, since we are to, uh, producing to the right of where your price equals your marginal cost or allocatively efficient, uh, there is uh, there is dead weight loss. So if you're producing to the right of allocative efficiency uh, or the socially optimal quantity, we could call it, again, that where price equals marginal cost, right there would be the quantity. I like to call it the socially optimal quantity. To the right of that socially optimal quantity would cause dead weight loss. If we were producing less than the socially optimal quantity, we'd have dead weight loss also. So we just have to explain that, that we're producing to the right more than uh, allocated to the efficient point or quantity uh, greater than where price equals marginal cost. Um, all right. I think that'll work. Uh, all right, I'm going to get rid of that, and then we'll jump into doing the oligopoly questions. And keep moving from there. All right, so to yada yada, heart patient expires, drug is considered whether it is marker stay out. It's a regular oligopoly question. They're all pretty much the same. Uh, the firms act independently and simultaneously choose their actions. So they're not working together to get the highest price possible. Uh, they're basically being what we call interdependent. They're making their choices based on what the other firm chooses to do. Uh, I always do these like a child. I do them the same way every time. I'm going to underline all of Hart's numbers. And I'm going to square in all of TX's numbers. Now, this somewhat helps me isolate exactly whose numbers are what. What I've noticed most on the AP exam is people get kind of lost in the numbers and write down the wrong thing. Then I'm going to make a little word chart. Nobody seems to want to draw the word chart out. They all want to do it super quick and get it over with. I, again, I'm like a child. I'm going to say when Hart, Hart only has two choices. They can QM or they can QZ. When heart QMs, then TX has to make a choice. And I'm just going to, I'm not going to fill it in yet. I'm just going to write it out. I know when heart QMs, TX will make a choice. Heart's other choice is to QZ. And then from that, TX will make another choice. And we'll go back and fill this in in just a second. Now, TX only has two choices. TX can stay out. And then Hart will have to make a choice. If TX decides to stay out first, Hart then has to make a choice. If TX decides to enter, Hart will have to make another choice. Now, once we've drawn out uh, our little word chart, then I go back and I look at the, what's actually happening here. If Hart decides to QM, we're in these two boxes here. These are this With Hart QMs, we're here. TX only has two choices. TX can stay out and make zero, or TX can enter and make one dollar. Obviously, he's going to enter. 
Um, now, let me get rid of those because it gets a little sloppy if I leave all of this stuff here. Instead, let's say that heart now wants to QZ. If heart QZs, then TX only has two choices. He can stay out or he can enter. If he enters, he loses a dollar. If he stays out, he doesn't lose anything. So obviously, he's going to stay out. That's his better choice. I hope that makes sense. All right, let's get rid of these, and then we'll do what happens if TX makes the choice. Let's say if TX decides to stay out, now we're in these two quadrants, and heart can either QM or QZ. If he QZs, he makes zero dollars. If he QMs, he makes 10, so he's going to QM. I hope that explains it well enough. Obviously, he's trying to make the most money. Um, all right. Now, if TX decides to enter, we're in these two boxes. And heart can either QM or heart can QZ. If he QZs, he loses $2. If he QMs, he'll make 4 bucks. Obviously, heart wants to QM. Because heart does the same thing both times. No matter what TX does, heart will always QM. Heart has a dominant strategy. Now, I don't know why, but for some reason that causes some stress with students. Understand what's going on here. When TX makes a choice, Hart always chooses QM. That is Hart's dominant strategy. Hart will always choose to QM. All right. Um, so let's go back and see. if Now that we've got our word chart filled out, we're going to go back and we're going to see if we can make the answers. Does TX have a dominant strategy? Explain using strategies and payoffs from the matrix. And we can see here that TX, when heart QMs, TX enters. And when heart QZs, TX stays out. That is not the TX doing the same thing every time. So TX does not, does not have a dominant strategy. All right? And the way we would explain this, we would say when hard QM, TX, and we've already written it out. When hard QM, TX is enters, and when hard QZs, TX stays out. Those right there are our explanation. And we would want to, they don't ask us to use numbers from the payoff matrix, but we could add those in if we needed to. Uh, what is the best response for heart if TX chooses to stay out? We've already done this. What is the best for heart when TX chooses to stay out? We've already answered this. We know it's QM. Don't have to explain it, just have to write it in. Identify the Nash equilibrium. So the Nash equilibrium is where nobody wants to move. Everybody is perfectly at their best spot, and there is no better choice for them. Now, the way to understand how to find that, oops, that's not what I want, is to know that first look to see if anybody has a dominant strategy. And we know Hart has a dominant strategy at QM. So I'm going to go in and just circle that QM. That is always Hart's best spot is QM. So we know what Hart's going to do, the Nash equilibrium. Remember, they both have to be equally happy uh, and not be willing to move. Well, we know Q Hart will always QM because we know the dominant strategy for heart. Now we just look at what TX does. And TX is going to choose to enter. When heart QMs, TX will enter. And that quadrant right there becomes our dominant strategy. So that dominant strategy is that heart will QM and TX will enter. I hope you can see that. These are done again and again the same way every time. First of all, we're going to find that dominant strategy. If there is no dominant strategy, if both firms have no dominant strategy, then it can get a little tricky. There could be zero, one, or two Nash equilibriums. No problem here, though, because somebody has a dominant strategy. If both firms were to have a dominant strategy, uh, then there's definitely one Nash equilibrium. If one firm has a dominant strategy, there is one Nash equilibrium. We know that. We don't have to think about it anymore. All right, my friends. I uh, hope that helped. Let me know. Leave me a comment. Something. Be safe. Take care.